the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, let it prove to be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength, and Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. For this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Let us all say together, amen. It is good to be here this morning, and we continue to lift up. Again, our prayers are being lifted up for God to heal this pandemic. And we are praying constantly for our, our medical community. Uh, we lifted them up on today for those who are risking their lives uh, to be able to uh, be the instruments of healing that God had designed them to be. Doctors, nurses, hospitals, medicine, everything. We lift them up before the Lord on today. But we recognize that the real healing is really in God's hands. We pray for those uh, families who are affected by this virus and those who've lost the battle uh, to this virus as well. And we continue, Lord, to pray for the community of the faith. And in the midst of all of these facts, that we continue in the faith of God, because only our faith will help control our fear and our panic. But you know what? Now, one of the things that I believe in my heart is that a crisis is designed to bring change. It's designed to bring change. And what we need to look at in terms of a community of faith is what do we need to change? What do we really need to change? I was talking to some people uh, yesterday, and they was talking about, you know, the promises of God. We're standing on his promises, and we talked about the life of the believer and, and, and the things that the way that we're supposed to live, an abundant life. Or that, that Jesus said, I come that you have life and have life more abundantly, John 10, 10. Or Ephesians 3.20, we got God that can give us exceedingly and abundantly and above everything we could ever ask for or everything we could even think of. A God who's able to supply all of our needs in the midst of everything. 4.13 in the Bible, Philippians 4.13, that God, we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. That we're not conquerors, we're more than conquerors. We can just go on and on and on, which says that the believer ought to thrive and not just survive. And one of the things that we're missing in the principle of this, we're missing the principle of Matthew 4.4, 4, where Jesus said, man, don't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So here's the thing I want to just drop in your, in your nugget today. We look at our church and we look at what church is doing. Are we thriving or are we just surviving? And one of the reasons why, because we are not living by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. So this morning, I just want to drop this nugget with you on today, and we're going to talk about some other things. But I want to talk, drop this in, in your spirit on today that was in my spirit. Why is it the church thriving and not just surviving? But one of the things that I believe in is what's called creative design. Creative design is to go back to Genesis and, and operate myself. Are we operating according to creative design? Another word creative, for creative design is called purpose. Nothing functions outside of its purpose. And purpose is not in the mind of the created. Purpose is in the mind of the creator. Because only when he gives us purpose... His, his purpose, we live according to his purpose, we get what he has for us. And so, first of all, as a church, we ought to be concerned is evangelistically. That's what Jesus was concerned about. He said, I didn't come, uh, I come to seek and to save them what, that are lost. So God has a biblical model of evangelism that help us to, as a church to learn how to thrive. It ought to be that all of us have the ministry, what is called the ministry of reconciliation, to establish, in 2 Corinthians 5.18, to establish the relationship back between a fallen man and a forgiven God. So how did that work? How did that really work? Let's go to Genesis 1.26. And God said he would create man in his own image and in his own likeness. And man would have what is called dominion over the, over the fish and the fowl of the air, over, over all the earth, he says, and over every creeping thing. That God said he would have dominion. But then he goes back in Genesis 1.28 and he tells us how do we do it. How do we have the dominion? Now the word dominion in the Bible means management. Management. Dominion doesn't mean ownership, it means management. So God has given us the management. 
Management means man age, the age of man. Management. And what is that management is supposed to do? It's supposed to carry out the purpose of God so that the will of God be done on earth as is done where? In heaven. But how do you do it? He gives four words I want you to hold on to today. He told Adam in, in Genesis 1.28, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish. And I want you to subdue. Those are the four words that leads us to dominion, to the purpose that God will have us to do, to help us to be able to thrive and not survive. Now, let me break those words down to you because evangelistic, I look at all over the country. People got evangelistic models, from, you know, we have a department of evangelism and all the stuff we're doing in evangelism. We're trying to get the people to the Lord, and I'm not discounting any of that. But God has always gave us a biblical model of evangelism. And it's in those four words the church strives this way. Now, let me just break it down to you and we can just go from there. The first thing he tells us to do is to be fruitful. To be fruitful. And the word fruitful in the Bible means to produce. Produce. Now, notice that the, God did not tell us to be seedful because you can't have fruit without a seed. He tells us to be fruitful. In other words, the seed comes from God. God never tells a man to make a seed. He tells him to bear fruit. And Jesus comes back in John 15 and, and makes it perfectly clear that until you, unless you're connected to the vine, you cannot bear fruit. The vine is Christ himself. It's Christ and his word. So within all of us, God has planted a seed. It is up to us to what? Produce the fruit. And when originally we were talking about children, they are talking about children, and in Psalm 127, he talks about the children of the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb. It's really his reward. But what is the seed? God has the seed already there. We need to what? To bear the fruit. So what is purpose? Purpose is when I am producing what God has planted already in me. That's the goal of my life, and it's called purpose. Help me define the purpose of my life so that I can produce in my life what you have already planted in me. And so number one, he says, I have children be fruitful because I've given you the seed. Now I need you to what? Produce. And then he goes to the word called multiply. Now the word multiply means to reproduce. In other words, God wants us to produce children but then he wants us to go and teach children that we can reproduce what he produced in us. And that's why the Bible says in Deuteronomy 6 that you need to go home and teach your children and talk about them when they walk around the house and talk about them when they lay down at night and talk about them when they get up in the morning. Why? Because you are in the position of training your children by reproducing what has been produced in you. And then the third word he says is called replenish. The word replenish in the Bible means to distribute. And so therefore, it doesn't matter what you produce. It doesn't matter what you reproduce. In any business or any product, you understand that it's distribution that makes progress. It doesn't matter what you produce, no matter what you reproduce. If it's still in the warehouse, if it's still in your inventory, it's not going to be productive. And that's why children are not raised to stay home. They're raised to leave home. So my responsibility, number one, is to reproduce. Produce this from the seed that God already planted in me. Whatever number of children he wanted me to have, he's already put the seed in me. And it's my job is to produce the, from the seed that God has planted in me. You know, I've often wrestled with this a lot. Is that when I get to heaven, God is not going to, hold me accountable for what I did, God's going to hold me accountable for what I should have done. He's not going to hold you accountable for how many children you had. He's going to hold you accountable for how many children you should have had. Because it was based upon the seed that I placed in you. 
So what the question is, did you produce what I placed in you? And then on top of that, he's going to hold you accountable. Did you reproduce? In other words, what did you teach your children? How did you train them? Did you reproduce what you produced? And then thirdly, grown children don't need to be home. They need to leave home so they can what? Distribute what I have reproduced in them. And so the more children I have, what? The more distribution I have and the more productive I can be uh, in the society because if I got children in New York and we got children in Texas, I got children in California, you know, guess what? What I have produced and reproduced is not in New York, it's not in California, it's not, and that's how it gets all over the world. So this is the thing that God is saying. He said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to turn around, produce. I want you to multiply. I want you to reproduce. I want you to replenish. I need you to distribute it from your household. It can get out. And then the last thing he says, to subdue it. The word subdue means to control. Control the market. Control the market. What does it mean by that? Is that, is that evangelism should be a dominating force in our country today if the church, if the believers will follow the model. We'll be able to control the market. So therefore, we don't have to come up with things. We don't have to come up with other things. We can do it the way God has to do it, and the Bible says you'll control the market. The way we're doing it is not working because what? We're not doing it according to the model that God already set in place. And so that way, he said, Adam, this is what I want the saints to do. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish. And then I want you to subdue. And it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. You look at the fact that the world seems to be a lot more successful than the saints. It's because the enemy has copied what God has made and made it work for him because we won't use it. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's take McDonald's for example. McDonald's. Well, so how successful is McDonald's? Here's the one to do. Number one, they came up with a product. They came up with a product, and then number two, what they did, they, they come back and what? And they what? Multiplied. They taught others how to do the product. And then they come back and number three, they distribute the product. It's called franchise. And so you got McDonald's over here, McDonald's over there, McDonald's over there. You got McDonald's now all over the world. And then they controlled the market by putting a patent on what they did to the point that they could say, you know, this is a Big Mac. Let me put a patent on that. Nobody else can call it a Big Mac. We need to have a unique identity of our own as a believer of faith and put a patent on it and say, guess what? This is what the people of God look like. So we got to what? We got to be fruitful. We got to what? We got to produce. God bring me to that. We got to what? We got to multiply. We got to reproduce it. We got to go home and teach our children. And it's amazing. And how many of you today are at home? What are you teaching your children? What are they learning? And how many of us are training our children to franchise what we learn. There ought to be a blunt franchise in California because my son is out there. A blunt franchise in Atlanta because my daughter and my sons are there. You got to franchise it. You got to what? Replenish it. And then you got to subdue it. And that means you got to have your distinct mark of who you are, the identity of who we are, in the world, not of the world, this is who we are. That's what it is. It's called management. This is the age of man. Now let me just drop this in your spirit and I'm going to move on from that. Our security in life is based on one thing, management. It's based on management. Now let me just tell you one thing that God has made it easy for us because... He didn't make us owners, he made us managers. He made sure he understood that he's the owner. That's why he's called Lord. Lord is ownership. 
So lordship is ownership. Now ownership is for our provision and our protection because ownership takes the liabilities from management. See, if, if, if I live my life like God owns my life, then guess what? All I got to do is manage my life. That means is to be responsible for that which belongs to somebody else to carry out the way he wants to carry it out so that when something goes wrong, then the management doesn't have the problem. It's the liability is on the owner. If I'm managing the house, the apartment, and then the apartment burns down, then that liability is not on the management. That liability is on the owner. And so God protects us that way by making us managers and not making us owners. Many people today don't know how to cope with their life because they're trying to act like they own their life instead of managing their life. And so therefore the liabilities come and they can't handle the liabilities. So management is the key to security. And let me say this to you. You're not going to get what you pray for. You say, I've been praying for this. And oftentimes we pray for stuff. I wonder why God doesn't give it to us. Because God is only going to give you what you can manage. Your resources are limited by your management. By your management. And if we're going to thrive, man, we got to understand the principles behind management. Let me give you five things today, and this is just my nugget for you on today. I hope I'm not boring you with this on, on today. But the idea, the mindset that we got to have, if we're going to thrive as a church, is that we got to go back and do the model the way God do it. We got to be in the position of reproducing. And that is not only just in our home, but in our lives and in our ministry, the seed that God has already planted in us. And that can only happen by being connected to the vine, be connected to the word of God so we can live out the purpose of God. And then we got, we got to teach our children. We got to reproduce them in our kids. And then what happened, we got to establish franchises when they leave home, that that mark that we have placed in them goes from our house to different areas of the world and make the impact on the world that it needs to have. And only then that we can have a spirit of dominion. We make our mark. A team is only successful as its management. You can have the most talented players in the world, but if you got poor management, it's not going to work. A business is only successful as its management. And so when God looks at your life, he looks at your life based on what you can manage. Now there are five D's I want to give you today as I leave here on today of management. If we're going to know how to thrive in the midst of a crisis and not just survive. And, you know, we spend most of our lives, even as churches, we spend most of our lives begging. Because we're not thriving, we're only surviving. Five things I want you to keep in mind in this crisis. If we're going to thrive in this crisis, there are five things I want to give you today. Number one, I want you to write this word down, determine. And what is the determination of everyone if you're going to survive? You've got to determine what you need. I mean, God has promised to supply what we need. What we want is not necessary what we need. And if you're going to survive, you're going to have to say, you got to say, this is just what I need. This is what I need. Because if I don't, I'm not going to manage my resources properly. And God is not going to give me any more. Because if I try to live beyond my need. So number one, you got to determine what you need. Number two, you got to decide not to live beyond your needs. You got to decide, I'm not going to live beyond my needs. There are a whole lot of things that I'm, I'm doing. I'm rechecking my life. I say, you know what? I can get more out of my resources if I don't try to live beyond I need. I, I don't really need that. I don't need to eat out every day. I need to bring a sandwich from home. I need to learn how to cook. Because I'm wasting a lot of resources and spending a lot of money on things I really don't need to spend that money on. So you got you, you to gotta decide what do you really need. What do you really need? Proverbs 13 
And if you get a chance to look it up in your, in your Bible, in verse number 22, and the Bible, and the Bible makes a, a, a step. He said, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Wow. This is a matter the sinner got all the wealth, but God really intended for the just to have it. He told Israel, I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be the lender and not the borrower. It's because we waste so much and we spend money on stuff we really don't need. You gotta decide what you need. You gotta decide what you need, amen? Number three, you gotta delete. You gotta delete what's unnecessary. You got to identify in your life what is unnecessary for you to live? I don't need to have all this. This is really not necessary. It's not really necessary. And there's some people in your life that you may be supporting. You say, look, they need to get a job because my just giving them money is just not necessary. you got to delete some things in your life that are not necessary for you to live on. Number four, this is management principles. You got delay in the major projects. We're in a crisis. We're in a crisis, amen? Fix the car up you got. Instead of buying another one, wash that one you got. Amen? Don't try to go out and buy any more clothes. Learn to get by with what you have. Delay major spending. Delay major products that you have that you really don't need. Here's number five. Don't try and impress other people. Don't try and impress other people. It's an interesting scripture in Proverbs 13 and 7. And the Proverbs 13 and 7, it says, there are those who pretend to be rich when they really don't have nothing. And the people that are wealthy, you won't even know they're wealthy. Don't try to impress nobody else. You know, these are five management principles that I am personally employing in my life. I'm cutting a lot of fat out. I'm cutting a lot of things I don't have to do. I'm looking at what I'm doing. Am I managing the resources of God? Remember Luke 16, 11, and the Bible said, if you're faithful in the least, God will let you be faithful in the much. But if you don't know how to handle the little things that God has given you, God will never trust you with the bigger things. And so I want our church and I want you as an individual, all of us as an individual, to learn how to thrive and not just survive. We trust the biblical principles of God. We trust the word of God. And the Bible says there's no reason why churches ought not to be thriving and not just surviving. I challenge us today as believers and people of God to go back to the Bible Live by the word of God because that's the only thing that's going to get us through. It's not what we're going through right now. It's what are we learning in the process of this. That this situation may be better, but it's actually designed to make us better. And that is the commitment that I want us as a church family to have and an individual to have as well. Go home. Look at your household. Look at your model. Look at what you're doing. Look at what God is doing in your life. And pray with me that God would help me to produce the seed that is already planted in me. And God, let me be about the business of reproducing what you have given me into somebody else. And then I pray that they can go out and distribute it. All of the people that I teach and all of the people here that I preach to, I want my preachers to become pastors and go out and distribute and go other places and distribute. Distribution is where the power is. And then, Lord, help us to be able to manage and control the market. God would make that happen. So today, Grady and Zion, and those who are listening to my voice today, that's my challenge word for you on today. And I wanted to remind you of this, that on tomorrow we'll be live streaming again uh, at 12 noon on tomorrow. And we're going to be talking about how do you defeat discouragement in this crisis. I want to also remind you that you can support this ministry. 
And, and this is important, in particular to those who are disciples and those who are following our ministry, that we, what, we sustain the ministry during this crisis, but we also want to pray for God's provision that we can supply ministry as it is needed, because it is going to be needed worse now than ever. Those of you who don't, don't know how to contribute to the ministry of GYZ, there are some ways I want to tell you as we get ready to close on today. Number one, you could go to our website, which is greateryoungzion.org, and just hit donations. And then guess what? It can make it happen right there. For those of you, you want to go to your bank, you can go to bill pay. And make Greater Young Zion one of your bills that you pay, and the bank will automatically send your contribution to the church. Or you can go to Give Plus, which is our app. Uh, that you'll be able to go to our app. If you don't know how to use it, call our office. We have someone talk to you and walk you through that. Or you can come by our office, our church, and drive through the office drive through We have an office drop box, and you can just drop your offering in there at any time uh, that you choose. Amen. And the last thing, you can mail your offering to Greater Young Zion. At P.O. Box 1864, Augusta, Georgia, 30903. We are determined in this age, and you know that we have elevated what we're doing in our teaching. For most of us, when there was not a crisis, you got Bible study and you got church. Now you got three sessions of teaching that we're going to bring to you every week. Sunday at 10 a.m., Tuesdays at 1030, Wednesdays at 12 noon. And I pray that you will join us. And if you miss the rest of the you can always go back and replay it on Facebook and YouTube. You can go back and get it again. I challenge you now as we walk through this crisis that we walk with God because he is continually walking with us. Let us pray. God, our Father, we want to thank you so much for what you have given us on today. And God, we just pray that you will continue to bless our church, bless our people. Bless us, Lord, in our attempt to let this light shine in the midst of darkness. We continue to lift up our medical people. We lift up our medical community. We lift up all of our sick and our shut-in. We lift up today, Father, those who've lost their lives to this crisis, those who are in hospitals right now. We lift them up to you right now. We continue to pray our people uh, to practice social distancing and to follow the directors of the medical community. We continue to employ. We pray for our leaders and the wisdom of our leaders, both nationally and state and local, that you would continue to bless them and lead them and guide them as well. But Lord, we ask this, that you would continue to glorify yourself in the midst of all of this. As we are living on the facts, let us continue to may be vigilant in our faith that we can not only be uh, conquerors, but more than conquerors. We trust you today, and we give it all to you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Let us say together, amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow, 12 noon.